Schultz Rory and Tool. And my name is Matt Schultz. And this is How to Be. The podcast where we discuss ancient wisdom, modern hacks, paperback self-help books, and pithy platitudes. In the hopes of figuring out the best way to live this one precious and wild life. Take a deep breath in through your nose and then let it out through your mouth. Could it really be so simple? Join us as we discuss breath. How are you? Oh, you know, fine with an asterisk. Sure. Um, I wanted to ask you, how's the rice experiment going? Oh, they're both, neither one has rotted at all. Really? And are you sending hate and love? Yeah. Well, I have some, you know, questions about it. It's like, do I need to hate the rice specifically or can I direct hate and love about other things at the rice? Mm. Actually, because- maybe the experiment was just you write hate or love on the jars. Maybe you're not even supposed to be sending it. From what I've read, they also send. They also send verbally or just psychically? Verbally. So I, every day I go up to the rice, I pick up the loved one. I say, I love you. You're so good. I try to make it about the rice. Mm. You know, I'm like, you're delicious. You go with everything. Um, you're such a wonderful food. You're a staple to so many different cultures. It's incredible <laughs> what you do. It's just incredible what you do. And you should feel really proud of yourself. Uh huh. But then I pick up the hate rice. And I'm like, I hate you. I hate you. You're bland. You're boring. You're a carbohydrate. You're making me fat. Um, you, you're you're nothing. You're nothing except what we put on top of you. Mm, okay. And so far, neither has flourished or collapsed under the weight of your words. N- no. So far, they're both doing great. They're both looking gorgeous. Oh, really? Now, yep. would you eat this rice? No. okay i would not not even the love rice okay and i'm definitely curious about what it smells like in that jar sure but you don't want to disrupt i want to disrupt the experiment but we'll do a smell test at the end of the experiment if that day ever comes yeah when is the the when does the experiment end that's a good question I think when one or both of them starts to rot. Oh, okay. If to the love one, it's proven failed. If to the hate one, it's a proven success. Obviously. Obviously. Have you, uh, do you have rice going? No, I never started my rice. I kept forgetting. Do it. No, now that I see how long it takes, I don't really want two it's jars. Of maybe your love and hate is maybe your beams are more powerful than mine. I just don't really want two wet jars of rice hanging around my apartment. Uh, why? I can't understand why. <laughs> yeah. I can't imagine why anyone wouldn't want that. You know, we have such ample space here in this palatial one bedroom. Yeah, put in one of the guest rooms. Yeah, maybe the guest bathroom. Yeah, put in the guest bath. It'll be a nice conversation piece when you have yeah. guests over. Yeah. Huh. No, but that big sigh I just made was a, an invitation to a segue. Ah. <sighs> oh, what's going on? Why'd you sigh so big? No, I'm just we're talking about breath today. Oh, we really are. Are we ready to get into it already? I I mean, I think I am. I okay. Don't know about you. Yes, we are talking about breath today. Um, Insert, and I can hear, feel you breathe. You're watching over me. What's that? Suddenly I'm melting into you. 
So many mm. songs about breath. Yeah, just breathe. Wait, is that what it is? Yeah. Just breathe. Who is that? Faith Hill. When my cards on the table and life's like an hourglass glued to the table. <laughs> what is that? It's like yeah. either Michelle Branch or Natalie Merchant. That's and those a totally are totally different, different song. Though. What is it? No, you're right. That's just breathe. Just breathe. Right? No one can find the rewind button, girl. So cradle your head in your hands and breathe. Just breathe. Who sings that? Listeners, if you know who sings. Anna Nalek. Oh, yeah. Anna Nalek. Of course. Really? I've never heard that name before in my life. Um, I mean, she wrote that song. So that's Did, where I've heard Have you heard that name before, though? Yes. When I've downloaded that song. <laughs> But I've played Life, that. Those are some lyrics. Life's like an hourglass glued to the table. Yeah. Wow. No, no mind button girl. Wow. Okay. I, I can't believe she didn't go farther than that one song. Yeah. And yeah, well, and now we're just stuck with Taylor Swift. Yeah, right. I mean, Taylor Swift, though, she can really turn it out. And now I'm I- disillusioned with Taylor Swift right now. Well, it's it's about time for everyone to become capitalism. Yeah, it's about time for everyone to turn on her, you know. Sometimes we don't turn on people as a society though. We lo- like Beyonce, there hasn't been a turn. Because she respectfully went away. And Did, she didn't go anywhere. One well, she is not overexposed. That's for damn sure. She's not overexposed. She did take, and she took a long break. And she'll yeah. never be on the talk show again, I feel. No, she'll never be sitting in that armchair talking about an upcoming project. No, no. I think some people don't like Beyonce, didn't like Beyonce though. What was like, when was she the most exposed? I don't know. People had things to say about Lemonade. Yeah, was that like the highest level of exposure? I don't know. And yeah, like the airing of the marital grievances yes. w- wandered dangerously close to um, Jada Pinkett territory. <laughs> yeah, but she only did it in song form, keeping us to guess who is Becky with the good hair. Yeah, whereas Jada Pinkett leaves us guessing about nothing. She read someone else's uh, scorned poetry in, in Lemonade. Yeah, Jada Pinkett. Ugh. So many celebrity memoirs right now. I'm thinking about reading Barbara's. Oh, really? Barbara. You obviously says I have a terrible Barbara Streisand impersonation. Barbara Streisand. Wow, that's it's so bad. You're usually pretty good, too. Barbara. No. You sound like, you sound like a mid-Atlantic newscaster from 1950. Um, Barbara Streisand how many gorgeous black and white portrait photos of herself do you think she has oh you know there's a lot there's a collection of artwork of herself in that house like how did she even choose one there's there's probably so many of her from her youth looking gorgeous in black and white half lit I went to like a gay art sale in Tel Aviv a few years ago. Uh-huh. And there were quite a few Barbara portraits there, as I recall. I mean, come on. One of the most beautiful women. She's so beautiful, especially in black and white. Yes. Just dying to be photographed. I guess it's like the bone structure. Yeah, it's in the eyes. The eyes... Les yeux lumineux, the eyes that sparkle. She really does. She does have eyes that sparkle. Um, I won't be reading that. Don't care, but do like her. I don't actually think I'll read it either. I don't think I'll ever read any celebrity memoir. I can't imagine why I would like sit down and dedicate myself. I should listen to that podcast though. Yeah, see, I, I'm interested in like celebrity personalities especially when they're like big personalities 
but I'm not interested in reading celebrity memoirs because as for me, r- reading is a uh, is a quest. It's a no book. I'm not going to waste my book time. Yeah, exactly. So the Celebrity Memoir Book Club podcast really helps me out. Yeah, waste my podcast time. Exactly. I need to fill my podcast time, actually. Yeah, my book time I need to dedicate to reading books that will make me feel better about myself in terms of like thinking I'm a smart person, a smart, well-read person. Well, that brings us to today's topic, I think, pretty well, which is that you read James Nestor. Well, I didn't really read it. I read some of it. Okay. Well, today, as we mentioned before, we're talking about breath. Why breath is a question I've always pondered because it's such a tenant of spirituality. Focus on the breath. And I'm like, why are we focusing on the breath? Why not focus on blinking? What is it about breath that's so special? Yeah, and well, why yeah, why focus on the breath and not blinking? Um, yeah, they're both there's some some similarities between breath and blinking because they're both uh things that happen without our conscious control, but we can bring them under conscious control. Exactly. It's not like uh digestion. It's and not it's like not digestion. Like moving your hand. It's somewhere in between. In terms of focusing on something when you're meditating, breath has the benefit of being rhythmic. You can't blink rhythmically? Boom, open, boom, open. I'm doing it right now. (laughs) You can breathe rhythmically, just like you can tap your foot rhythmically, but your breath is rhythmic on its own. You can tap into it and just pay attention to it. Now, if you're going to blink rhythmically you're that's going to have to be a lot more on the conscious control side than the breath yeah that's true i mean i guess my question is would could we even be spiritual breathing beings if we didn't breathe yeah like if there was some sort of opening on our body that just took in air continuously not in a pulsating rhythmic way mhm with no conscious control, just always happening, would that, you know, could we, what would, what would our spirituality look like then? Yeah. Like if our breathing was like our digestion, how could we, like, could we be spiritual beings? Well, maybe God gave us breath in order to be spiritual beings. That's certainly how the um, Bible has it. Um, Because the breath of life is what separates humans from just like clumps of matter. You know, God sculpts the humans and then breathes the breath of life into them. Now, that's an interesting point that not all things that breathe have a conscious spiritual practice. But I mean, but maybe they do because, you know, Madame Lowry says that tree plants don't have souls. And maybe it's because they don't breathe in this way. They're just kind of always breathing. Oh, like soul equals breath. Soul equals breath. Madame Lowry says trees are amazing. They're amazing, like meeting points of all these different energies. They're like a dialogue between all these different spiritual energies, and they're doing so much. But they do not have souls. They do not reincarnate they do not um and you know maybe there's something here about what it means to be to conceive of oneself as an individual and the most essential thing about breath is in inside of me out outside of me Mm -hmm. so breathing sort of defines the boundaries of the self and is also a way of uh it's an intermediary between self and not self. But maybe for the tree, the tree whose whose connection points with um, outer reality are constant and continuous. There's no in-out. It's always in and always out, always at the same time. 
maybe that's a more oceanic consciousness that doesn't have the individual selfhood required to be a spiritual being. Because to be a spiritual being, you have to be a little bit unspiritual so that you even have the motivation to do spiritual work. You have to be like, you need some sort of distance from God in order to have a a spiritual practice to connect with God. Mm, Like it fills the space between. But she does say about trees that they're, they share energy between one another through their roots. I mean, isn't that all what it's about though, with human beings too, is like trying to feel more connected to each other. Yeah, I think it is. Recognize that oceanic connection. Yes. And that's why we have spiritual practices because we don't just have that naturally. The tree is just there. Yeah. It's just there. The tree knows about how interconnected the universe is. Humans don't. We're we're under the illusion of separateness. Yes, yes. Why we need spiritual work to bring us back into connection with each other. Yes, absolutely agree. Tell us a little bit about this book. What does James Nestor say about breathing? Because there's breathing as the spiritual practice. Then there's breathing as sort of mindfulness, which mindfulness is sort of the despiritualization of classic spiritual practices almost. It's like the way we've sterilized it to make it appealing to the secular masses, right? I think that's a negative spin on mindfulness that I'm not sure if I would, if I would apply that lens to it. I definitely know what you're talking about though. There's like the mindfulness industry, yes, which wants to sell mindfulness, which wants to sell basically like spirituality as a, as like a means of recharging your batteries so you can be a better employee, like capitalist mindfulness mick mindfulness they sometimes call it oh, they do <laughs> i love that it's like any <laughs> any critique of capitalism like in that sense it's just adding mick in front of it classic how do you feel about that as an irish you know if yeah. only about the irish um if only-, if only the irish were that important to people <laughs> um, um. But I, I guess I don't mean it to be totally negative. I think mindfulness is absolutely so important, but it feels like uh, sanitized in this way. Sometimes the way people talk about it, like on Good Morning America, like mindfulness practices to make sure that you can, you know, not beat your children. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like the the goal is not universe is not god consciousness and the universal brotherhood of all humankind yeah the goal is like are you looking to de-stress from a hard day of work on the weekend you know it's like it's much more terrestrial and it's much more like not threatening the system yeah and i get that it's i mean most of us are not going to be living our lives to um become Tibetan monks or anything like that. So it's actually a lot more applicable to just think of it as mindfulness, present moment, yada, yada. I just think it's interesting that the way we can like put something through a little scrub machine and sort of take away certain parts and I guess leave the rest. Yeah, it's very interesting. You know, the the Talmud is a very um, popular book in Korea. Hmm, interesting. And what's the Talmud? The Talmud is the major compendium of Jewish oral traditions. Jewish oral. And so it's not the, the law book. There's law in it, and there's myth, and there's yeah. discussion and debate. It's full of all sorts of things. Uh-huh. But it's different from the Torah. Um, yeah. The t- basically, in Judaism, we believe that we have two Torahs. One written which is the the one we think of when we say torah the big scroll Uh and one the oral which was just an oral tradition but then they they committed it to writing in the middle ages because um it was made illegal to to study it and there were you know um people needed to like preserve it Mm -hmm. so they wrote it down 
But in Korea, they sell it, you know, edited down versions of it, selections of it. And they, it's sort of thought of as like, Jews have this reputation of being smart and successful. And it's sold as like the secret to Jewish success, <laughs> studying Talmud. And, and it's kind of like that. It's kind of like, let's boil this down to like one tangible benefit that we think we can get from it. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I don't find this offensive at all. It's just a, it's just similar to what we've done with meditation. Right, exactly. Yes. So it, this book that you read, James Nestor, is it like that? Is it like mindfulness? Is it like, what, what's the what's the point of view? Where are we starting from when we open this book? So it's it's pop journalism, um, which is not to say that it's not thorough and and good. He took a breathing class that really changed his life. And then he went on a journey and talking to different people about breath. So he meets with scientists, he participates in experiments, he talks with religious leaders, he talks with divers who are like really good at holding their breath, all these yeah. different things. He reads a, a bunch of ancient like Vedic manuals on breath. Um, from like the Hindu tradition. Mm -hmm. And yeah, he's like, this is the key to life. It will help you lose weight, regulate your emotions, feel happier, be healthier, not get cancer. You know, the whole... It's everything. It's the whole, the scope, right? Full scope. The whole scope. And he's also like, humans are the worst breathers on the planet. Like the way we've evolved has made us really bad breathers and we have our mouths are too small um i did see um i watched a tiny short video with him on like gail king's morning show cbs um about <laughs> our jaws are small because they're weak because as he puts it we eat industrialized mush yeah we eat mush, and I'm like, we also eat a lot of crackers, but I guess that's not... You were just chomping on an apple. Yeah, I was just chomping on an apple. <laughs> and I'm exhausted now. <laughs> this is... Well, I don't understand why we've... Why, why does evolution... I guess because it's an ongoing process, but why would we evolve, evolve into bad breathers? Well, it gave us other benefits. Th this particular mouth shape is what enables our speech. I see. I see. So do you think one day we'll evolve to be able to speak and breathe better? He seems to think that we can breathe better in this life, but we just oh. have to, to work at it. Now, why do our mouths being small have to af affect our breathing? Because shouldn't we be breathing for through our nose anyway? Yes, we should. And that's, I, I don't have a good answer to that. But his the first chapter, which is really the only chapter I read, um, he does an experiment where he plugs up his nose and only mouth, mouth, breathe, mouth breathes for two weeks. Two weeks? By the way, did you see that Instagram I sent you with that family of 13 kids? Oh, uh, the Dockery Dozen is a household name in this house. Matt, because the older ones were given mouth breathing on. Shoot, they all were. They all needed some work. They all needed some work. And <laughs> this is the thing. I thought the youngest four were cute, but the oldest five were. If there's a hundred of you, like you're not getting the attention you need. You know, you're not getting the breath instruction, are you? Yeah, you're definitely not. So, so I I've lived this when 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 my allergies are really bad. I'm mouth breathing for weeks and i can attest to exactly what he experiences which is that it's absolute hell tell me you dehydrate you get headaches you have mental fogginess you feel tired you sleep horribly oh like i hate waking that. up after a night of mouth breathing sleep it, the the way your mouth feels you feel like a corpse rising from the dead, but not because you're alive. You're still dead. You're just rising. <laughs> that is the thing is whenever I have like a really stuffy nose, which is rare, much rarer than in your case, which is a, an annual occurrence. I, it's hard to even fall asleep breathing through your mouth. It's so 
miserable. And when he was saying on Gail King's little morning show was that your nose is basically everything inside your nose is like a little filtration system Mm -hmm. that gives better quality air to your lungs than your mouth also. It gets the air to the right temperature. It moisturizes the air. It filters out all the pollutants. Yeah. Honestly, unbelievable. Crazy. But like, are our noses smaller than they were before? They definitely seem it. Look at a horse's nose. I mean, we didn't evolve from horses. Look at a a gorilla's nose. (laughs) Yeah. This is the thing. It's like, I have pretty small nostrils. Do you think that you breathe better than me overall, structurally? Because I have big nostrils? You're a man with a big old nostril nose. (laughs) I don't know. Um, Or is it everything that's important to get to your lungs gets there? his philosophy seems to be that you you can you can work with what you got yeah yeah absolutely we've all got different equipment but we can all work on this so i kind of you know like i want to take a breathwork class i'm sold um now obviously i'm not gonna go too crazy on this as i sometimes do with things Mm -hmm. um and i don't think it's going to help me lose five pounds yeah, that I love that claim. It's like, put that on the book. You'll sell a lot. Yeah, like breathe. Oh, breathing. I can do that. Why would it help you lose weight? It just it speeds up your metabolism. Yeah, your body just uh, like works better. Oh, okay, interesting. Um, well, I will say that it feels so good to breathe really well and deeply. Like the first couple breaths I take when I'm going into my meditation is seriously so it's so cathartic it instantly relaxes me makes me wonder why i haven't been doing this all day i know there's a real pleasure to it and when yeah when someone reminds you to take a breath you're like oh cool yeah except for that um you know i struggle with a lot of anxiety and i've had many therapists be like just focus on your just take deep breaths focus on your breathing and i once just told my therapist that's baby stuff I need some some real advice here. Yeah. And like when I went to that meditation class the other day when I was anxious, it was not helping. I was like, I actually need to like sit out on a street corner with a glass of wine and hear the city noises distracting me from my breath. Yeah. And of course, as someone with... OCD and I have a little bit of somatic OCD. This was happening to me last night when I was researching breath for this episode. Um, Sometimes like it happens more with blinking, but sometimes I can become really fixated on breath in an obsessive, unhealthy way. Like, I don't know. I'm sure, I'm sure there are listeners out there who um, occasionally you'll be falling asleep and become too keenly aware of your heartbeat and it causes insane anxiety. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely happened to me. I, that's interesting, too, the pulsation of the heartbeat, which, like, used to really disturb me, sort of this, like, spasm motion of it. Boop, boop, boop. It's, like, really, there's something repulsive about it, the way it, it spasms over and over again. Ugh. I almost wish that our heart was more like a bellows, you know, like a fireplace bellows open close i i wish our heartbeat was more like breath (laughs) yeah i guess that's what you're saying i the thing about breathe in the blood breathe the blood back out but there's something profound about the heartbeat also which i guess um you know alan watts talks a lot about pulsation he's like everything in the world is is flickering in and out of being really fast Mm. And that's what reality is. And and the fact that it looks, you know, sturdy and solid to us is really just an illusion of the fact that it's flickering too fast well, that's for us to a, catch. I think that's a component of getting really tuned into your heartbeat is not only can, is there something sort of biologically repulsive, <laughs> but you become so aware of how important your heartbeat is to and this thing seems so what's the word i'm looking for um precarious 
Yeah, it could just stop. If pulse stops. It's over. Yeah, it needs to do this. It can't miss one. That the stakes are so high. Yeah, the stakes are really high. I mean, the stakes with breath are high too, but we're just lucky that air is everywhere. Yeah, the stakes with breath are really high, but we I think we have a little more of an illusion of control over it. I mean, we a lot of times we can control it to a certain extent. Um so that makes it a little bit easier to come to terms with. Yeah, and air is just so abundant, so we don't worry about like running out of it or get, you know. Yeah. We don't even think of air as a thing. We just think of air as the space we're in, even though it's like this precious resource. But, but like, if you were trapped on an elevator, <laughs> reminding me of that Frasier episode, if you were yeah. trapped on an elevator, how quickly would you run out of air? <laughs> is this a thing that you would need to worry about? Or are those little, there are little ways that air is sneaking in, so it's fine? That's a great question. Like, yeah, is the air getting in? Like, it would have to be like a vacuum sealed room for air to not get in. Also, you know what's weird about breath? That what we breathe out isn't the same thing we breathed in. Wait, what'd you say? It's really weird that what we breathe out isn't the same thing that we breathe in. It is. I mean, it's honestly unbelievable that our body takes what it needs and then pushes back out the rest. And then we have this amazing relationship with plants where they're like, we'll take that and give you this. Wait, but I, here's my question. Tell me. Are Tell we... Me everything. Are we pushing... Are we taking what we need and pushing out the rest? Or are we taking something in, putting it in a box, and then taking something out of a different box and pushing that out? No. In my research yesterday, what happens is we breathe in air. It goes into our lungs. Our lungs take the oxygen and put it into our bloodstream. Mm -hmm. And everything back into our esophagus and pushes it back out. And that's carbon dioxide. Yeah, and nitrogen and whatever. Everything but oxygen that's in the air. So all that's carbon dioxide and nitrogen is just in the air that we breathe in. Yes, we breathe it all in. And our lungs sort it. Okay. What are the trees doing then? Because they take in the carbon dioxide and push out oxygen, right? Yeah. Don't, don't you see, like, it, it doesn't quite make sense. Like, if I gave you oatmeal with strawberries and you picked the strawberries out and gave me back the oatmeal, I can't now take that oatmeal and give back strawberries. Oh, I see what you're saying. I, I don't think it's like a one for one. I think it's like what it is, is it's like a giant, say, picture a giant buffet. <laughs> of all sorts of different kinds of oatmeals and berries. Yeah. We're all taking from the buffet and leaving more, leaving the rest, right? Mm-hmm. Or maybe, so there, there's more oxygen in the air when you're in a room with a plant percentage wise but maybe not amount wise okay i have Does no idea you have you're, plants in your house these are just insane speculations actually what'd you say does it make a difference to I have, have heard, plants in your house i have heard it does make a difference the air is cleaner as they say but you mm-hmm. obviously can live without plants now, I live in a place with like such bad air quality. And sometimes th- to really think about your breath when you think about the air quality is a little depressing. But I guess it's like you got to trust your lungs to sort this stuff out. Well, no, I mean, we know that bad air quality has a negative effect on us. Yeah, but maybe it wouldn't if I was really good at breathing, mm-hmm. like James Nestor wants me to be. I mean, that's a good question. I, you know, apparently there's so many toxins in the home that even if you are live in a city with bad air quality, you should still keep the windows open because it's still better than what whatever you're breathing in your disgusting apartment. Yeah, cooking and cooking. cleaning supplies and yeah. Why are we? Why is? How did? Why haven't we conquered cooking yet? You can't. You just can't heat up food like that without little particulates coming into the air it's just 
it, it, it just goes to show there's no simple answer for anything. And it, it, it really makes you want to just throw in the towel. Yeah, but like also we're doing fine, aren't we? I mean, people are like, living longer. Yeah, for sure, a hundred percent. But there's no way to like hack the system. I guess what I mean. I feel like there's so many people who are like, "This is the secret to life: like eating no dyes or whatever." But then it's like, mm-hmm. well, are you cooking your food? You know what I mean? There's no like way that you can't be affected negatively in some way by your environment. Well, yeah. And I mean, that's, and that's, that's what we're here. For. I mean, that, why shouldn't we be, you know, we're not here on earth to live perfect, unaltered lives. No, certainly not. I think the appeal of a book that promises to increase your lifespan, reduce your risk of disease and help you lose weight is precisely that it reinforces the illusion of control right um and i think that probably these like spiritual adepts who develop these techniques even though they may have derived a great many of those benefits were very aware that you can't control the universe And they're all dead. (laughs) Which we all will be one day. Although I really do want to do an episode on longevity and people who want to live forever. um, Because I find that fascinating. I'm sure everyone does. Um, Okay. Speaking of like the wise ones of ancient times really had something with breath. Like they've been here with breath for so long. Um, realizing it makes a difference in the way you feel psychologically. Mm -hmm. Another great example of, what's the word I'm looking for? Like results. And then we have the sign. Now we have the science to back it up, right? Because it's like, oh, focus on the breath, taking deep breaths. And now we know why it, you know, what, what do they say? It triggers your parasympathetic nervous system and the vagus nerve and brings when you have more oxygen coming into your brain you're more relaxed yeah it's interesting like how we process like knowledge as a society like we've talked about this so many times like we love studies and like what would it mean to like not have a study to just be like do this it will work and we have a lot of that too we have people telling us that rose quartz will you know heal your knee pain um and they have no information and i guess the the idea of the study is that it helps you prevent yourself prevent keep yourself from being swindled or conned it helps you in the comment section of an instagram post <laughs> to have a study yeah to be able Show that TV for children will make their eyes pop out of their heads. To be able to say that, so powerful. Yeah, we love the study. We're obsessed with the study. I personally am obsessed with the study. I'm like, actually, what would I do if I couldn't be like, actually, you don't need eight glasses of water a day? That was based on a study from the 1940s, which was also including food intake. Yeah, and the, the power of saying the power of saying that study was actually really flawed. Oh, you read the methodology? No, but someone else did. <laughs> someone else did. Yeah, I know the study you're citing actually, and they had <laughs> uh, a really small sample group, and they didn't even follow up with them. I and mean, those side effects wouldn't have kicked in until after four months anyway. So it's really you know, there's not much we can learn from that. But it's like, we can't dismiss the study because otherwise um, all these people, kids wouldn't be getting vaccinated because their parents think it makes them autistic because there's been such a rise of autism diagnoses. No, no, we certainly can't dismiss the study, but it's just like, yeah, it's interesting that especially like in the realm of spirituality, like the study, the, the study that confirms the ancient spiritual knowledge. Yeah, I mean, it's so disappointing to me that there isn't more robust 
support for acupuncture. You want it to be there. Of course. Have you had positive experiences with acupuncture? Opposite, opposite. I've had negative. I went to acupuncture like very regularly for my jaw issue and it didn't um, improve it in any way. Confirmed by the doctors themselves. They were like, wow, this isn't really working for you. Um, And then, you know, for the most part, there's limited research that it has. It's like acupuncture works essentially because it relaxes you. Okay. You know? Yeah. And you, just but why me, do you want just give studies me. to be there? You would think you would have had a positive experience if the studies showed it worked? No, I want the studies to be there because I want it to be an option if ever I need it again for something else. I know. Well, yeah, it's like we, we want these things to work. Yeah. Like vitamin C, like vitamin C, there's been no evidence that it helps with illness, like vitamin C supplement. Um, and, but I still take it. Really? You take like, um, that invented by a teacher thing. Oh yeah. But do I take it? Cause I think it'll help. Or do I take it? Cause it's yummy. Well, you know, I've been snacking while we've been talking on these fiber gummies. <laughs> don't, don't do too many of those. I only had the, the correct dosage, but I love them. Do they help fiber wise? <laughs> Studies show that I don't know, but okay. Back to breath. So I think the thing with like Buddhist meditation is like the, like the idea with meditation in, in Zen Buddhism, it's like the idea is to just do what you're doing and nothing else. So meditation is not something you do when you're sitting. Meditation is the act of just sitting and doing nothing else. Like the the sort of way of 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 Zen Buddhism is to like really be present with what you're doing and not add on to it all these other like narratives that we add on to things and distractions. Well, so really like in you can whatever you're doing you can never not also be breathing so maybe that's why breath it sort of is the fundamental spiritual act and i do think that that deep meditators deep buddhist monks are also in relationship with their circulatory system oh yeah like their heartbeat yeah i think i think they're they're doing the same thing with that as they're doing with breath, but that's not really available to the novice because it's, you have to get much deeper for that. They're slowing down their heart rates. They're doing crazy things. I mean, that's what you do when you're panicking, right? You do slow down your breath in hopes of slowing down your heart rate. But I I think they, they get there directly. I agree. I agree. I think that there's many more um, powers over over the body once you get to like a deeper spiritual state. I don't know if studies show that though. We'll have to check. <laughs> we but know. I agree that it's it's like you meditate. When I took a Zen Buddhist meditation class in high school, uh, it's only just it's just counting your breaths, and every time you like lose count, you start from the beginning, and I think you count to like thirty six, and then start over. Um, and at the end of the class, we had to go around and say how the class has influenced our daily lives. And this one guy was like, honestly, I'm not meditating every day, but I swim every day. And it has helped me pay so much more attention, um, and be like more present when I'm swimming. I just focus on my breath and the teacher like lit up. He was like, you could tell that this really was like, aha, like you get it, you know? Mm. Um, and I think that is the point is we are carrying our breath with us. And so why not carry that breath awareness with us everywhere we go? Yeah. And it can always, it can always anchor you. And that's what I find when 
I meditate. And I think this is a cool thing about meditation, which is that you you inevitably drift off into some sort of a daydream or you're arguing with someone or you're fantasizing about what you're going to do later. And sometimes you just drift a little bit away and you call yourself back. And sometimes you drift really far away, like you're flying in a deep train of thought, you know? Mm -hmm. But the journey... This is going to sound cheesy, I think, but the journey back to the present is always the same distance. Mm. No matter how far you go, you can go really far or you can go not far. You can go this way, you can go that way. But the journey back to the present is always as simple as just like clicking into your breath. And it's always right there. Yes, absolutely. Is that cheesy or profound or just like... Can it be both? I guess Study it can, things can be cheesy and insightful. No, I think it's most of them. It's insightful. Very insightful. Live, laugh, love. And when I, what'd you say? Live, laugh, love. Cheesy and profound, if you <laughs> ask me. Yeah, see an earlier episode. Um, but when I was researching breath, yes. One, oh, oh no, you know what was crazy, actually? Tell me. Um, Yesterday I was meditating and I was doing a, my, um, meditation app and I click there's uh, sometimes there will be a theme and I clicked just any, let the universe decide the theme. And the theme was breath. Oh my God. That universe, that algorithm. (laughs) I know they knew. And Fiona was like, it has been said that no one can steal your breath. Remember, Mm. your breath is always there to center you. This is exactly what she was saying to me. No one can steal your breath. And you know, there in Hebrew, the word for breath and the word for soul are pretty much the same. I think in Latin too. Really? Yeah, I think I think so. I read something like that when I was Googling breath, important, spiritual. Why? (laughs) <laughs> well i guess yeah i mean that is and w- didn't we talk about this in our last episode like you see a living person you see a dead person like what's the dif- what's the most immediate difference yeah breath the breath has gone out of them they're no longer doing this up down thing yeah and isn't the soul as ethereal as the breath yeah perhaps yeah perhaps Oh yeah, it is. It's, it's, um, spirit. Spirit in Latin is like respiration. Mm. Mm-hmm. And actually, so, and then you have aspirations, like I aspire to be, um, you no. know, a I scientist, think. whatever. And he, in modern Hebrew, when they when they needed to create a word for aspirations because there wasn't one in biblical hebrew they copied that that etymological link and what's the hebrew word for aspiration um uh shefa, which is the same word as in to inhale mm. oh interesting isn't that intriguing but anyways um what was i saying before that Breath, soul, ethereal. That was me. Yeah, the 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 very idea that there's some that there's like a ghostly presence within us mm-hmm. has to be connected to the fact that like a very big part of our physicality is this ghostly dance we do with air all the time. Yeah, I mean, and who can forget that that's how they used to, that's why they buried people alive accidentally because they were only checking if you were breathing or not. Yeah, it's not the best way to check. (laughs) It's a provisional way to check for life. But it is so interesting because now you can, there's sort of this weird limbo state of living where you can be, you know, artificially breathing with machines in the hospital. Mm-hmm. And so your body is still, it's not decaying. It's still, 
in a, a living state to an extent. But you're brain dead. But you're brain dead and you can't breathe on your own. But I guess breathing on your own, we have fixed that problem. We can make you breathe. Yeah. Yeah, it's very bizarre. Why? I'm sure Madame Lowry has talked about what's going on with the soul there. Oh, I, you know, I don't think it's I, I don't I don't think it's an ideal position. No, because I don't think the soul can completely walk away from that situation. No, uh, I don't know. It's hard to say. I think there's they're still in the room. Yeah, studies show there's you're still in the room, begging for Fraser to be turned on. Begging for someone to come turn on the TV. Have we talked to the audience about that? Yeah, we have. Yeah, Rory's job, if I'm ever in a coma, is to make sure there's always TV on. Keep the Frasers running. Keep the Frasers running. Keep Put the new... I haven't been keeping up with the new episodes. Oh, well, I, I, I'm i one behind. I'll catch up. There's been other things going on, obviously. Yeah, sure. Other TV to watch, too. There's been other TV to watch. Yeah. There's been deep breaths. Oh, my God. I woke up at 4.30 the other day. Okay. The amount of meditation I did was just so incredible. Oh, you were like, I have all this time. Let's use it to meditate. I meditated. I did morning pages. I prayed in a really spacious way everything with the breath it really was a great foundation for the day <laughs> did you have a better day no i was so tired because i didn't get enough sleep oh oh no i mean but i'm always tired so oh okay i hope there's a chapter in this book maybe i'll keep reading it we'll see if about like energy breath i want a breath that's like you know like some sort of breathing technique that's like you know cocaine um yeah like wim hof isn't that what that kind of is well i mean jumping in ice water will definitely wake you up <laughs> i'm also thinking of switching to cold showers i would love that i would love to hear how that journey goes for you for me it's just about dry skin the hot showers have been making my my legs very dry and itchy lately and the cold the cool shower leaves my legs feeling relaxed and nice you lukewarm yeah they're they haven't been cold they're just like uh, you know bait like the temperature you'd bathe the baby in mm -hmm. which most adults would consider like unacceptably cold oh is that right yeah it's one of the hardest things about being a baby you don't get to have a nice hot shower <laughs> besides all that industrial mush they make you eat yeah, weakening your jaw. <laughs> I want to know what he thinks about my jaw being so restricted from TMJ. He Well, I think he has that too. He's like a bad breather. Now, well, are we all just, we're born bad breathers and... He's, I think he came to this though because he was like a very bad breather. It's so incredible to me that you can be a bad breather, something you just do so automatically. I mean, I have a lot of breath issues. I've got allergies. He seems to think we can cure our allergies with the, these techniques too, which I find very tempting, of course. Oh, I think you need to throw yourself into this then. By the time you have a few months until allergy season starts. Oh, yeah. But just a few. You better get going. Just a few. Can acupuncture your allergies? Have you ever looked into that? I have. It's, they definitely have it for that. I've never tried out acupuncture. Mm. Maybe. They actually offer it through my school, which is weird. Oh, okay. They're like, rabbinical students need acupuncture. <laughs> this is the thing. That's one thing that's really interesting about acupuncture is that, like, it's really permeated Western medicine for some reason. Um, yeah, it's, it's a it's real being recommended. Yeah, it's become a real standard of care. The docs are recommending. Yeah, it's supplementary medicine, they call it. Oh, is that what they call it? Well, this the, James Nestor arrived to a breath 
workshop, like a sort of hippy dippy breath workshop through a, a, a real doctor. Oh but yeah. Breath is real. Breath is real though. The oxygen that- to your blood cells and the blood cells, you know what I mean? Yeah, but he talks about, and it's a good point, he talks about how little, like, our medicine system cares about breath. Like, you go for a physical, the doctor, like, usually doesn't really, like, talk to you much about your breath. They talk about your blood pressure. They don't check your blood oxygen level necessarily. Yeah, absolutely. It's like, yeah, because on the CBS show, he was, morning show, he was saying so many things can be cured from breath. And then they were like, but then why did we stop focusing on breath? And then he was like, well, modern medicine, we thought it would be easier to just take a pill. Yeah. Um, and also, I do think that there's like, okay, well, we're, I don't know, well, we're breathing. So we don't need, there's no like, I guess the idea of a spectrum of quality of breath. Yeah, it's just not how we think of things. Yeah. We think of breath as binary. And yeah. that's what his book's really about saying that breath is not binary. It's not a matter of breathing or not. Mouth breathing is very different. And yeah, like this idea that the nose and the mouth are just like redundancies, like, oh, breathe through one, breathe through the other, whatever. Right. I think I'm going to watch one of his videos with the five techniques to make you breathe better. Yeah. That's all I probably need. Yeah, that's... I might skip to the back of the book that just has the techniques. Yeah, because I don't need the evolutionary understanding of breath. No, I don't need the interview with the coral reef divers. <laughs> you know, that's a thing about like the nonfiction book market. Also, like a lot of things are just really could be a long article, but there's not really a market for long articles. There's a market for books. Yeah, it could have been a pamphlet. So people are forced to... Fill up the book. Fill up the book. And what better way to fill up the book than with studies? Yeah. And case studies. Margaret came to me complaining of, you know, if it's written by a doctor, they love that. Oh, yeah. I wish that that this person had... Uh, interviewed Kate Winslet, who learned how to hold her breath for four minutes to film Avatar. Really? Water. As like Titanic? Not Titanic, though, interestingly enough. Wait, Kate Winslet's in Avatar? The second Avatar, I think. Oh, I forgot about that. It, it that movie was so bad. The first one or the second one? The second one. Oh, you saw the second one? I did. Did you like the first one? I did. Interesting. Do you think you'd like the first one now? I think so. It's quite a fun movie. Wow. I didn't find it fun. I found it long. But I saw the second one. It was so boring and long. Also, I was on that in one of those theaters where the chair moves around and spits on you. Oh my God, you saw it in 4DX? I saw it in 4DX. I hated it. I was like, I do not feel immersed. I actually feel demersed. Like I keep being pulled out of the movie because I'm in pain. I can't believe you never. The chair is throwing me around, abusing me, spitting on me, spraying like Febreze on me. Like you see these like gorgeous plants on the screen and it sprays like floral febreze on you and you're like that's not what those plants would smell like what oh wow so interesting you know because our friend lexi's obsessed with 4dx movies she like is always wanting to see every movie (laughs) with that experience yes i'm very anti i saw a bullet train in 4dx which was actually a good movie to see because that movie it's not like um you know a weighty movie it's not like i'm trying to experience the fauna or the I f- want to see sliding doors in 40X. <laughs> I want to feel Gwyneth Paltrow getting the haircut. <laughs> I want them to like, you know, like when the blow dryer is going, I want to feel like the blow dryer on my on my neck. What and the obviously the comb. Yeah, I want a little scratchy comb. And obviously, you know, I want, want to feel those doors slam shut. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. 
but could they materialize could they capture and thrust upon you the pain the heartbreak of seeing your boyfriend it would punch you in the gut (laughs) she walks in on her boyfriend sleeping with someone else and like a robot arm punches you in the gut I want to see Sliding Frasers, the episode of Frasier that's based off Sliding Doors and 4DX. Yes, I would also go see a screening of that. I want to okay. feel Frasier trying on the blazer, trying on the sweater, trying on the blazer, trying on the Dr. sweater. Dr. Frasier Crane or just Frasier? Or just Frasier. Any hoodie. Any in hoodie. The book. Well, I think it is all about the breasts. I'm going to certainly keep investing in it a little bit. I actually do think that if there's one way out of this, it's through the breath. And I'm grateful that we have it because what if we didn't have it? If we didn't have breath, we'd be talking about blinking right now. Yeah. How could we express our spiritual, our spiritualness? Could we? All about the blinking, the blink of life. (laughs) That's true. We'd be waxing poetic on the blink of life. Yeah. The ability to just see, blink. The ability to see, unsee, see, unsee. Yeah, there's something to it for sure. It speaks to our. I think we'd find something. Oh yeah, we'd find something. We, if, if if nothing else, we're seekers. Seekers, seekers. So breath, it is how to be, and yeah. will be. All right, Matt. All right, rare. I will talk to you later. T-T-Y-L. Oh, wait. Before we go, I just what? want to remind everyone to like and share. Like this it. Podcast. Please share it. Please share it. Just to give us one share, share. Yeah. Sharon. Spread the word. Share with a Sharon, okay? <laughs> Today is, yeah, it's share with a Sharon week. <laughs> share with a Sharon of your choice. Find the best Sharon in your life or the worst. And make sure they know about this podcast. The one who needs it the most. (laughs) All right. Bye, Matt. Bye-bye.